What's up guys, welcome back to Daniel Talks Football right here on YouTube. I am Daniel and we are back with another video. In this video we are going to be reacting to the World Cup Game Week 1. Game Week 1 has now finished and every team has played. So we're going to go through, react to some of the games, react to some of the games we haven't talked about. Give some thoughts on some of the teams, some of the players and just yeah, have a nice little chat. This will probably be a bit of a longer video. But I wanted to get something out just to round off the first game week, to round off the first games for every side before i do get into the video please make sure to like the video comment down below also subscribe to the channel this is the second video coming out today and there's also going to be two videos coming out tomorrow so turn the notification bell on as well so that you're notified when i upload also please go over and follow the instagram and the tiktok daniel talks football on both right let's get into it and the first game of the week was qatar versus ecuador in which ecuador came out to nil winners in group a Let's start with Qatar. Now, Qatar, you're an embarrassment. I'm going to be honest. How are you here? How have you been given the World Cup? You're not a footballing nation. You should have been given the World Cup. We know that you... Oh, well, it's most likely that you've paid your way here. It's shocking, really. This Qatar side looked absolutely awful. You know, you look at their goalkeeper made a couple of mistakes. Ecuador walked all over them. And Ecuador are not an excellent side. They're a good side, not an excellent side. Qatar looked really, really poor during this game. And, you know, Ecuador, you know, got that 2-0 lead and then just sort of went, you know what, it's fine. We'll we'll take the foot off the gas here because we don't need to press hard because we need to save energy. Ecuador could have won that game 5-6-7-0 if they wanted to. Qatar looked absolutely shocking and simply an embarrassment, in all honesty. They shouldn't be at the tournament. If they had to qualify, they'd be nowhere near this tournament. They're not good enough. It's simple as. But we will move to Ecuador. And Enna Valencia. God, he looks good, doesn't he? He scored two goals. And nearly scored another. If uh, if VAR wouldn't have been checking every single little toe for offside. He looks really good. Really good. Obviously, we've seen him in the Prem before with West Ham, I think it was. Maybe it was Everton. And he looked like a really good player then. He looked like a really, really good player didn't show, showed showed times of being a really really good player i don't think it's fair to say he did it all the time because otherwise you know he wouldn't have he would have got to move to a bigger club he showed it in brief spells but versus Qatar, he looks like the real deal i hope the injury isn't too serious i hope that we can see him again this game week but yeah and valencia you look good mate we'll move on to uh, the second game in group a and that was senegal versus netherlands now we'll start with senegal in this one they looked good they played Netherlands to their own game. You know, they, they sat back fairly well. This Senegal side, they weren't looking to attack so attack so much. They were just looking to try and get a point out of the game, possibly. To then go and get, you know, six out of the next two games. And then easily progress with seven. They couldn't quite do that. You know, they managed to hold out Netherlands until the 84th when Gakpo got his goal. But they couldn't quite hold on for that long. I think one of the main parts of the Senegal side, and the thing I do want to say is, are they missing Sadio Mane? If this Senegal side has Mane in it, I feel like, you know, they can attack a little bit more. They can feel a little bit safer in going forward. Yeah, and look at how they did perform versus the Dutch. And I wasn't overly... I wasn't overly convinced. They looked good. They looked good defensively. And I'm going to praise them highly because they looked really good defensively for 80 minutes. Yet yeah, going forward, I just feel like, you know, if you've got... A, you, they had a Sadio Mane shaped hole. And if you've got Mane in that side, they can do so much more. So, yeah, I mean, there's not much to say on Senegal, really. You know, they played well for 80 minutes. They held Netherlands, and at the end of the day, they were just outclassed by the better side. The Dutch, again, just outclassed Netherlands in sort of the last 15 minutes. But apart from that, weren't exactly excellent. The one person I did want to point out was Frankie de Jong. You can see why Manchester United, why Chelsea, why all of these teams were all over him last summer. Because this guy is incredible. He's going to be one of those midfielders this this summer. Probably with Bellingham that all the sides are chasing. If teams can't get Bellingham, they will go and knock for De Jong. Frankie De Jong looked excellent in this game. And he controlled the play for the Dutch really, really well. He was spraying balls left, right and centre. He looks like a top, top player. Obviously, he's already at Barcelona. But with Barcelona's financial issues, if you can tempt him to come out of that side, if you can pay him the wages, if you can do all of this, he would be an excellent player for a team like Liverpool to maybe go in and get if they could get that done. Frankie de Jong looked absolutely excellent in this game. And, 
yeah, I was really, really impressed with him. We'll move on to Group B now. And we will start off in Group B by talking about Iran, actually. Because we've obviously did a England versus Iran match reaction. And within that, I did say, you know, I wonder if Iran have just had an off day here. Because they've got a good manager. They've got a decent side. I can't remember if I put in third or fourth my prediction experience, but they've got a de- they've got a good manager. They do have a very good manager. I think, you know, he's done he's done bits in world. He's done bits in you know club football. He's managed quite a couple of top teams. I think it was just an off day for around this. They did obviously concede six. They had their goalkeeper go off injured, and that's never a good way to start a game, especially with his long throws being such a big component for that Iranian side. They were making a political statement in the game as well by not singing the national anthem to go against all of the troubles that are happening in Iran at the moment. If you don't know about them, there's a lot of uh, human rights issues in Iran going on at the moment, especially to do with sexism. So the Iranian players wanted to protest that. That's what the focus was on for them in this game, I'm sure, and it wasn't particularly winning the game. They could still go through if they get six points versus USA and Wales. I don't think they will. I really don't. But I don't think they're as bad as they showed. I feel like it was just an off day for them. And yeah, there's not much too much to say. English, English, England, sorry. We've done a whole video on England on the channel. So I'm not going to reflect on them too much. Because we did a match reaction to this sitting in the Victoria Centre in Nottingham straight after the game. England looked good. <laughs> England has looked good. If you want to find out more of what I said, you can go and watch the match reaction. It'll be quite a few videos back now with all the videos we're releasing. But you can go and check that out. England looked good. Overshadowed by the uh, Captain Darn Band controversy, possibly. I hope they make a statement in the next game, but we'll find out that tonight. England looked alright, so there's not really much more to say. We'll move on to the second game in Group B now, and that is USA versus Wales. Now, I don't really have much to say for Wales from this one, so I actually just want to give a bit of credit to Nico Williams. He's a Forest player and I'm a Leicester fan, so I don't like giving credit to the guy. But we've all seen what he's come out and said, you know, that his granddad died, you know, a couple of hours before the game. He spent the whole day crying before going out onto the pitch and kind of, you know, doing it for doing it for his granddad. That, you know, fair play to the lad. You admit losing someone a couple of hours before your first ever World Cup game cannot be easy. And he put in a decent performance versus this American side, especially with everything he had going on in his personal life. So Nico Williams, I take my hat off to you. He might be a Forest player, but fair play in all honesty. And then USA, this side is quality. If I look at the lineup that played versus that world side, we've got people like Pulisic. We know about him. Timothy Weyer. Is it? Is it? Yeah, it's Timothy. It's not George because that's his dad. Um, quality plays for Lille. Musa, really good, came through the Arsenal Academy. Adams, good, playing for Leeds. McKenney, good, playing for... Is he, I think he's still at Juve. People like Dest, playing for AC Milan at the moment, you know. Matt Turner got a move to Arsenal. There's some really top players within this side. I mentioned it in the prediction video that I think is coming out after this. I'm not sure, but I think it's coming out after this. I feel like USA just need a better manager. If they could go out and get Somebody like maybe Jesse Marsh, if that doesn't work out uh, uh, at Leeds, they could go out and get Jesse Marsh. I think that would be a really, really good move for them because they do need a class manager. And I just don't think their current guy does it for them. Reminds me a bit of Ted Lasso, to be honest, the current guy. And I know Jesse Marsh does as well, but I feel like that's just every American manager. I feel like the US do need a better manager to take them to the next level. And if they do get one, then I could really see this side going places. We'll move on into Group C now and into the sh- biggest shock of Group C, and that is Saudi Arabia versus Argentina. Argentina are currently bottom of Group C after the loss to Saudi Arabia. We'll touch on Argentina first. I do actually want to speak about Saudi Arabia here, but we will touch on Argentina first. What happened? They had the possession. They had the shots of the shots on target. There's no reason Argentina should have lost this game to the Saudis. They did. But they absolutely shouldn't have done. This is supposed to be Messi's final World Cup. This is supposed to be his big farewell to the national st- to the international stage. You know, going and getting a World Cup. And at the moment, it does not like the rest of the players in this Argentinian side are capable of doing that. I do want to highlight 
Enzo Fernandez though. We spoke about him in the prediction videos, and I think even Oli put him as his uh, player of the tournament. I don't think he's going to be quite that good. Or maybe it was his surprise of the tournament. I don't think he's going to be quite that good. He might be a surprise of the tournament, to be honest, but I don't think he's going to be a player of the tournament. But he did look really, really good, and he changed his game for Argentina when he came onto the pitch. He really put that Saudi Arabian side under some threat when he came on, and he looks like a top, top player. Currently at Benfica, I could easily see, again, he's a midfielder. I could see a side like Liverpool, like United, being in for him this summer, maybe even City. There's a lot of sides that need midfielders this summer, and I can see him being one of the ones that is really in, really in demand. Saudi Arabia now, and wow, his side are good. Saudi Arabia are actually kind of good. I'm not just being done by the scoreline here because I know the stats in the game aren't excellent, but they managed to find a way to grind out the victory. You know, this Saudi Arabian side took a, had a bank holiday because of this. You know, 30% possession, yet still enough to, to win this game. They've got a really good manager of Saudi Arabia. Um, he actually impresses me a lot and the things I've seen of him so far, I haven't seen loads of him, but the things I've seen of him, his name escapes me at the moment, I can't lie. But the things I have seen of him, he looks like a top, top manager. This Saudi Arabian side, it looks like it could maybe do something. Depending on how they're doing this match day, if they if they do win in game week two, this side could be could be progressing to the to the next round, which would be which would be absolutely mental. Mexico versus Poland. Now I'm struggling for anything to talk about during this game. It was nil nil. Lewandowski missed a penalty, but again, that's not particularly something to talk about. Yeah, let's speak. I'm struggling. Let's speak about the striker option that Mexico went for in this game. They chose to go with a guy called Henry Martin, who is currently playing for Club America, 30 years old, instead of Raul Jimenez. Now, Raul Jimenez used to be the big person for this side. He used to be the guy that would always start and would score the goals for them. Now it looks as if he's not even getting into the side. It's been a big fall off for Raul Jimenez ever since that head injury, and it is a concern. The other thing I do need to mention about Mexico is the goalkeeper. My word, Guilamo Ochoa. Who do you play for? Who are you? And why do you turn up every four years and turn into Buffon? The bloke's 37 now, you'll still be going at the age of 63. He turns up every single World Cup. Nobody know, Nobody watches, I mean he plays for Club America, I do know that. But nobody watches him week in week out nobody you know he's not in Europe you know he's not in Brazil or something he's like Club America yet every World Cup he just turns into a top top goalkeeper it's a shame that this guy couldn't have had a chance in Europe possibly to really really prove himself because I would have been interested to see what he could have done Poland now and <laughs> there's a lot of skis in their team Yeah, that's a really good analysis from Daniel Talks Football here. Group D now! <laughs> because I'm going to be honest, what can I say about Poland? I didn't watch the game, if you can't tell. Den Denmark versus Tunisia. One game I didn't watch to another game I didn't watch. Um, this Danish side should have done better in this game. But that's not what I want to reflect on. I want to reflect on, again, something that's above football. And I want to reflect on the fact that Christian Eriksen started this game. A guy that, obviously, we know what happened to him last year, Rose... And I think, in all honesty, you know, it broke a lot of people. It broke, I remember watching it on my iPad, just kind of going, what is going on? I remember actually walking downstairs and sort of saying, I think I've just seen Christian Eriksen die on a football pitch. And now to see him walk out at a World Cup, I'm, I'm actually really happy to see it. You know, I want this Danish side to do well because Eriksen deserves it. After everything he's been through, this Danish, the Danes have a very good side. And I don't really want to. But I don't really want to talk about football. Like Christian Eriksen. I just want to again take my hat off to you. Incredible. And Tunisia, fair play on kind of stopping this Danish side. You don't. Uh, Hannibal Medjugorje obviously played in this game and looked quite good coming off the bench. I thought. I thought you know steady coming off the bench, but I thought it looked alright. And you know a player that United obviously have out on loan company at Birmingham. I do believe. So we'll have to see if this guy's uh, if this guy's growth continues, and if it does, then you know we could see him playing in the United show one day. Schnitzel looked alright though. I thought their goalkeeper Damen 
think that's how you pronounce it. I thought he was quite good. He made a couple of good stops. But yeah, it's a no-no game. It's not too much to talk about. France versus Australia. You know, we'll talk about Australia first. I think, this, first of all, this Australia side, it excited me for, you know, 15, 20 minutes until Rabio scored. It really, really excited me because I thought, are we going to see another Saudi Arabia versus Argentina here? Are we going to see another big defeat that nobody is expecting? It didn't turn out that way. But this Australian side wasn't expected to do anything at this World Cup. You look at the side that Australia came out with, and it's not particularly incredible. I mean, the probably one of the shining lights of this side is Kuol, I think it's pronounced, Gawang Kuol, who's uh, currently at Central Coast Mariners, 18 years old. Is he, he might be the one that's going to Newcastle, actually, I'm not sure. But I don't think anybody particularly expected much out of this Australian side. You know, some of their best players, looking at people like Aaron Moy, who's now at Celtic after going to the Chinese League for a couple of years. Their right back, Nathaniel Atkinson, what a bloke, great surname. But yeah, there's just not much to say about Australia. France, though, wow. Wow. And I could talk about a lot in this French side, but the guy I do want to speak about... Well, there's quite a few guys I want to speak about. I want to speak about Drew. I want to speak about Mbappe. And I want to speak about Theo Hernandez. We'll start with Theo Hernandez, actually. Coming on to a place of brother Luca in the 13th minute. And he he looks excellent. Any side that's looking for a left back right now, you need to go to AC Milan and you need to buy this guy. You know, 60, 70 million it might cost you, yes. But he is incredible. He can easily go on to become the best left back in the world. And I'm not overhyping him there by saying that at all. I thought Theo Hernandez looked really, really good in this game. And he looks like a shining light for this French side. You know, as soon as he came on in that 13th minute, things started to change for France before, you know, they ended up getting the goals. I thought he looked really, really good. I want to speak about Rabiot as well. I didn't mention him before. I do want to speak about Rabiot. Contract up in the summer of 2023. Was linked with that move to United last summer. However, it didn't end up happening because of a couple of things. However, I think the fan protests did have a role to play in that. What's next for him? Because Juve aren't going to sign him to a new contract. So where does he go next? Does he go to a lower league French? Uh, not a lower league, but a lower down the table French side, something like a PSG. So maybe Lille or Marseille or someone like that. Does he maybe try and go for an English adventure and go for a Wolves or someone like that? The issue is this guy wants a lot of wages and his agent, his own mum, is very hard to deal with. I'm not quite sure how Rabio is going to work, but he looked good in this game. And if he can keep up, he could easily get a top move. But I just can't particularly see it. We'll talk about Mbappe. Mbappe didn't look great in this game. I think he's got a lot more to offer. And if that's Mbappe off form, what's Mbappe on form? He missed a couple of good chances. But that didn't matter because Olivier Giroud did the job. Olivier Giroud, a man who is now 36, is still banging in goals. Thomas Tuchel wrote off Giroud. He sort of went, we're going to sell you for 2 million quid. You're not good enough. He's gone to AC Milan and he's really proved his worth. He looked really, really good in this game. And <laughs> Giroud, he ages like a fine wine. He's a very, he's a very attractive man, Giroud. And he, he is, come on. And he, he's aged like a fine wine, both in football and properly. Olivier Giroud looks a really, really good player and I wonder how long he can keep it up for. He probably doesn't have another move in him, but how many more contracts is he going to keep signing these one-year extensions at AC Milan like Ivo has done? I don't know, but it interests me. Right, Group E now. It's going to go to Group F, but Group E now. Ah, oh, and there's only one place to start. Germany versus Japan. 2-1 to, to, to Japan. I was going to do a separate video on this, but simply I never got around to it because I've been so flipping busy. Well, for Japan, I have to credit the manager. The substitutions that Japan made in this game were absolutely incredible. You know, Moriyasu, he really changed the game with his substitutions. People like Doan Minamino, Tomiyasu, that changed for Tomiyasu for Kubo at half time, really changed the tide of this game before bringing on people like Mitoma, Doan, and Minamino, who obviously all ended up combining to score the goals. 
Asano looks really good. He looks like a really, really top player, who again was another substitute that came onto the pitch. The substitutions changed this game for Japan, and it's a shock. It wasn't a, it wasn't a shock then, because this Japan side, it doesn't particularly scream excellent. People like Aito and Kamada, they're all right players. Kubo, a former Galactico. But they got the job done over Germany. How far is Japan side going to go if they can be, if they can beat Costa Rica, which they should, they should easily get through to the next round, six points. This Germany side are in trouble, and what's happening in this German side? It's clear the lack of a number nine is harming them. Some people have criticised the decision to play Sule at right back. I think that's a good decision. I know Sule doesn't particularly look like a right back, but he's fairly skillful on the ball. I don't blame them for playing him there. It's the lack of a striker, though, for me. And the contradiction with Japan's great substitutions. Germans, Germany's first idea of an attacking change was Mario Goetze and Niklas Falkrig. Jonas Hoffmann as well. These players aren't... You've got better players on the bench. People like Kareem Adeyemi. People like... Yusuf Mukoku, who didn't come on until the 90th minute. You've got Leroy Sane sitting on the bench. Why not try him instead of Musiala or Nabri or Havertz? Havertz isn't a number nine. And people need to realise he is not a number nine. He will not work as a number nine. If you want to keep playing him as a number nine, he will turn out a flop everywhere he goes. He is a cam. He is a number 10. This Germany side, it doesn't look good for them. I think they'll end up going out in the groups and... It's not good news for them. We'll move on to uh, Spain versus Costa Rica. Costa Rica just aren't very good, are they? Yeah, you know, Speed can't pronounce the name. Costa Rica. This side just doesn't look very good. This side have, has relied on Kaylor Navas' excellent for, excellence for quite a few years now. And in this game, Navas was appalling, in all honesty. Hasn't played for PSG so far this season. Was trying to get a move to Napoli in the summer, but obviously never ended up actually coming off. I mean, one football I've given them a 2.0 rating for this game, and I'd more than happily agree with that, conceding seven goals versus the Spanish side that don't even have an out-and-out -out striker who's actually any good. You know, they played Asensio slash Torres as the number nine in this game. Costa Rica out in the groups, and they've got a long way to rebuild. Spain, though, it's hard to comment on Spain. This is a side that a lot of people have kind of gone... Yeah, they're all right. They'll get to you know. They'll get to you know the round of sixteen, the quarters, and they'll get knocked out. I know they won seven 0 but this is half to do with Costa Rica being absolutely awful. I could. I'm going to highlight a couple of things for Spain. The first one is Alvaro, Alvaro Morata being their only actually good striker. That is a bit of a worry. Spain need to basically Spain need to produce a good striker because you can't have Ferran Torres being the main goal scorer for this side when you're going up against top, top sides. I'm interested to see how they're going to do against Germany with somebody like Ferran Torres as a striker, but I don't think he's excellent. The Barcelona presence in this side is obviously obvious with Torres, Pedri, Busquets, Gabi, Alba. They did obviously also bring on Alejandro Balde for Alba, a guy that uh, I think was it Betis wanted on loan in the summer, but Barcelona went, no, we want to keep him. He's had an excellent year so far for Barca, actually. Played quite a few games for the club and is really turning into a good player. 19 years old, obviously. And I think Alejandro Balde, he could he is the regen of Jordi Alba. He looks like a top, top player. I'm interested to see how far his career goes. We've got three groups left to do now. And we'll start with Group F. Morocco versus Croatia. Again, another nil-nil. Again, another game I didn't watch. Um, I'm struggling for what to talk about here. Morocco, I think it's a good result for them, getting a draw versus Croatia. Somebody like ZX didn't particularly in interest me or didn't particularly have a good impact on this game. Hakimi, obviously an excellent player. Could probably play anywhere up that right side where he wanted him to. Croatia, silently solid i really like the look of guardiola i thought he was excellent during this game being a really good defender to move all over the pitch you've got teams like spurs like chelsea they're interested in him obviously towards the end of the window chelsea sent that big bid to leipzig of a 90 million uh 
to buy him for 90 million and loan him back for the season. Leipzig rejected that because they feel like they could get more for him. This Croatian side look they, they look like a very good side on paper. And I know a lot of people think they're getting older, you know, because of people like Modric, because of somebody like Rakitic. Because of these players, people are kind of going, ah, oh, you know, Croatia, they're getting older. Rakitic isn't in the squad, first of all. Is he in the squad or have I just missed him? I don't know, but I cannot find Rakitic in the squad. You've got somebody like Kovacic who can play, 20, 28. Brozovic as well, he's not overly old, 30. The attack isn't excellent. Vlasic didn't impress at West Ham, has gone to Torino and I think he's doing okay. I've, I haven't checked him. Oh no, he's doing um, four goals so far this season. That's not awful. Kramaric is quietly, you know, fine. 101 goals and 219 games for Hoffenheim. And Perisic getting older at the age of 33 now has lost his pace that always made him so special. This Croatia side, they need to do well versus... They need to do well in this sort of next bit. I'm trying to find out who they've got now because I genuinely can't remember. Um, Croatia or Belgium, they need to probably try and get a point out of that or they will be staring... They will be staring, uh, getting knocked out down the face. I like, I like p parts of the Croatia side, however, they do need to freshen up a little bit in places, especially that attack. We'll move to Belgium versus Canada now, and this is a game that I watched, and a game that I actually really enjoyed watching. End-to-end -end football, Canada, Canada looked the better side in this one. I don't know the possession stats. Oh, well, like Belgium did have more. It felt like Canada had more of the ball. Canada felt like the better side in this. Obviously, uh, Alfonso Davies missing the penalty. Jonathan David didn't impress me too much, but people like Buchanan or Buchanan, people like Laia, La, La, La Estaquio really impressed me actually, Hutchinson appearing in that midfield at the age of 39, this side looks quite good, and I tipped them to go far in the run up to the tournament, I'm going to be honest, I didn't think that they would actually be that good, I was kind of doing it because I had an inkling, there wasn't anything behind it, but people like Buchanan and Laia, Laia, however you pronounce it. These guys look like top, top players. In this Canadian side, it impresses me a lot. If David can pick it up, if Alfonso Davies can stop missing penalties, then this Canadian side could really go far in this tournament. And then Belgium. Michi Batshuayi with the goal, a guy that I was slating for the full 90 minutes. I don't know how this guy's starting for Belgium. I'm going to be honest. He is not very good. How are you keeping people like Trossard, Doku, Torgan Hazard, Append uh, De Ketelaire, Mertens on the bench when you're literally playing for Fenerbahce at the age of 29. Batshuayi, I'm not sure how good he actually is. He had a really good loan spell at Dortmund a couple of years back, but then, you know, went to places like Crystal Palace and didn't particularly impress me. Forrest were trying to sign him on loan on deadline day, but couldn't get it over the line in the end. There's some good elements in this Belgian side. You've obviously got people like Castagno and Tiedemann's players that I know all about. De Bruyne didn't particularly show his excellence in this game. Then Donka as a, as a centre-back, again, not convinced. We've got people like Woot Fast, like Arta Tiata on the bench, even Amadou Ronan who can play that role. But this Belgian side looked alright under uh, Roberto Martinez, and I feel like they could possibly do something in this tournament. And yet again, we need to see how they perform versus the hardest side in this group in Croatia. And then, moving on to the games that were played yesterday, we've got Switzerland versus Cameroon. Didn't watch the game. 1-0 win for Switzerland. Again, I don't really know what to say about it. Good good victory for Switzerland to get this done. It means that they're in a strong position. Now, anybody that got that opening win, it means they're in a very strong position because, you know, they know that, you know, if they can now stay undefeated going in the next two games, they'll probably go through with five. There's some good players in the Swiss side. People like Mbolo, Shakiri, Xhaka, Froehler, Elvedi, Akanji, Sommer. There's some solid players in this side. In... They, they could easily, easily be underdog material. In Bodo, a player I've liked for a long time. I've kept an eye on him for, you know, sort of four or five years now. Uh, I know his name, I know his middle name's Donald for some reason. I'm not quite sure why that is. But he impresses me. Playing for Monaco at the moment. I'm not quite sure how he's done so far this season. Eight goals so far for Monaco. He looks all right. He's looking like we're doing, he's looking like he's doing quite well. And he's a player that does impress me. Um, Cameroon 
did look excellent in this game, I'm going to be honest. Uh, true promoting was fairly, fairly average. Um, 33 years old now, playing for Bayern. Has actually been fairly well at Bayern, you know. He was a player that a lot of people didn't expect to do well. A player that a lot of people were kind of going, uh... I don't, how's he got this move to buy? And his agent's the best agent in the world. You know, this was a guy that was playing for Stoke a couple of years back. Got a move to PSG somehow. And then got a move to Bayern. Yeah, he's been doing fairly well on that Bayern side. For this Cameroon side, I didn't think he was excellent playing alongside people like Mbuemo, who's only literally just become Cameroon. Ian, he's French, let's be honest, he is. Tokua Kambi, again, another player that hasn't particularly impressed so far in this World Cup or at Leon really so far. Uh, he's got 36 goals in 98 games, playing mainly as a winger. Zambo and Guisa are a player that again has really impressed ever since his moved from Fulham. But I didn't watch the game so I can't comment on it. A game I did watch was Brazil versus Serbia. Now let's touch on Richardson. I said Vinicius Jr. and Neymar are going to be the two shining lights of this side. I think it was really with Charleston, in all honesty. I think this guy looked excellent, scored an excellent goal for this Brazilian side, and he looked really, really good. One thing that this Brazilian side does have in its masses is they've got partnerships already built. A lot of sides are having to build partnerships as they go through the tournament. But Brazil, they've got people like Fred and Casemiro who can play together, who know each other, who play at United. They've got Vinicius Jr. and they've got Rodrigo who play together at... Real Madrid and they know each other and they know each other's playing styles. You've got Gabriel Jesus and Martinelli who play at Arsenal. They know each other's playing styles. Anthony obviously in there as well with that United contingent. These partnerships really help in a World Cup when you've had six days to prepare for it. And it's another reason why I'm tipping Brazil to go and win this tournament. They didn't look overly uh, convincing in this game. But there's something about them and I just have a lot of belief in them. Serbia... They played well. At, at, they played well for points in this game, but as soon as they had to go and attack the game a little bit more, Brazil found them out. Brazil is an excellent side, and Tite is an excellent tactician, really. You know, when Serbia was sitting back, they managed to contain Brazil, but as soon as they had to start pushing, Brazil could just pick holes in them. Here's the thing with this Brazilian side: is as soon as they score one versus any side that isn't Argentina or England or any of the top sides. Th they will just score more because that side will have to start coming out, especially in the knockout stages. Those sides will have to come and attack and Brazil will just be able to play behind them, play beyond them. Brazil are a really, really good side. Serbia, you'll be all right. You've got some good players in there. People like Milinkovic, Savic, people like Mitrovic, Tadic. I really like Lukic, actually. He's a player I've kept in my arm for quite a while and I think he's doing really, really well at Torino. Serbia will be fine. I'm sure you'll still qualify, especially with that other game going to Switzerland. I think you can beat some Switzerland. I think you can beat Cameroon and you'll be perfectly fine. Group H now and the final group that we will talk through. It's been a very long video, so I hope you have enjoyed it. If you have, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe. We're on the run to 100 subscribers. Uruguay versus South Korea. No, no draw. Again, another game I didn't watch. Uh, having, having no... Uh, I was going to say son that's what i was going to talk about how is his injury affecting him he obviously played during this game he does have an injury and i think we all know he is carrying an injury he didn't look he didn't look excellent in this game from what i've heard and yeah the other thing i want to touch on with south korea i don't envy any commentators i just want to read you the uh south korean back uh, back five so in goal you've got kim at left back you've got Kim, at centre back you've got Kim and Kim, and at right back you've got Kim. <sighs> I'm sorry to any commentators that to commentate on this game. I think I'm actually going to do a YouTube short on the South Korean back five because it, it, it it's funny. You've got five Kims. Yeah, it's quite funny, isn't it? But no, South Korea... Are you going to qualify from the group? I still think not. I still think Uruguay are going to best you. This Uruguay side with people like Valverde, Bentenker... Jimenez, Suarez, Nunes, Cavani coming off the bench as well. They look like a really good side. I do want to touch on uh, Valverde. This player, again, he's another exceptional midfielder. This isn't a player that's going to get a move. He's at Real Madrid and he'll stay at Real Madrid. But you looked at what he was doing, sort of coming back for that final South Korean attack and the passion he showed when he managed to get the tackle in. He's a really, really good player. He shows a lot of passion and he's a player that, you know, I like a lot. Last but not least, Portugal versus Karna. God, this has been a long video. Portugal look good. 
Cristiano Ronaldo obviously starting off the scoring with them, Felix and Leal uh, finishing it off. This Portuguese side, they've got a lot going for them. You've obviously got Ronaldo being a free agent that's going to... It's going to haunt over them for the whole tournament. You've got to have people talking about, oh, where's Ronaldo going to move next? What's going to happen here? I did a video on Ronaldo, so if you haven't watched that, go and check that out. But Bruno looked good. Felix looked good. Bernardo Silva, Cancelo. This side is this Portuguese side is a really, really good Portuguese side. I would easily say it's a sort of golden generation for Portugal, just because of the amount of quality players they have at their uh, exposal. Ex is that right? I can't remember the word. But yeah, Portugal look good. I think yeah, they'll easily win the group and they'll be fine. Ghana, good show from them. I want to touch on Mohamed Kudus though. This play was excellent. Still at Ajax currently. Playing really well for them week in, week out. Doing really well for Ghana in this game, I thought. Again, it's another midfielder that I could see a game with. This could be one on the cheap end, maybe 40, 50 million compared to the you know, 120, 150 you're going to have to pay for Jude. Kudos looks like a top, top player and I think he's going to easily be getting a move sooner or later. And on that note, we are done with reviewing game week one of the World Cup. I hope you have enjoyed the video. I hope you've enjoyed the longest sit-down video. Second video coming out, or maybe it's the first video. I don't know when it's coming out. It's coming out later today, and there's going to be a second video coming out on the channel later, doing our uh, game week one prediction, uh, game week two part one predictions. Make sure you tune into part two again tomorrow. But thank you all for watching this video, and I'll catch you all again later. See you.